This is ODAT Chat, your instant connection to recovery and community, one day at a time. This podcast may contain strong language, sexual content, and spiritual truth. Listener discretion is advised. This episode is brought to you by Audible.com. Right now, I'm listening to The Miracle Morning for Addiction Recovery, Letting Go of Who You've Been for Who You Can Become by Hal Elrod, Anna David, and Joe Polish. This is the book I wish I would have written, but that's okay because it was written by three amazing people, and I'll actually be interviewing one of them next week. The New York Times bestselling author, Anna David. She wrote a book called Party Girl that is amazing. She's so funny. Hilarious. She actually has her own podcast, and I'll tell you more about that later. I'm actually a little beside myself with how excited I am to be interviewing her. Uh, but more to come on that later. Anyway, back to audible.com. Since you are an ODAT chat listener, you can get the first book free. All you need to do is visit odatchat.com and look for the Audible banner on the right. It's a monthly subscription for about 15 bucks. Truth be told, I've spent more than that on a single drink back in the day, and all I got was better. Go figure. Try it out, and who knows, you might drown out that pesky critical voice in your head long enough to realize how truly fabulous you are. Hi friend, welcome to ODAT Chat. My name is Arlena, and I'll be your host. The primary purpose of the podcast is to carry the message of hope to those who are still suffering from alcoholism and addiction. My guests and I talk about their addiction stories, how they were able to break that addiction, and what a life in recovery looks like today. Through these conversations, I'm looking to uncover the really specific actions they took and the daily habits or routines that lead to healing and long-term recovery. Today's episode is with Anton Anderson, author of Bargain Basement Jesus and Greatness Written in Your DNA. (laughs) What the hell was that? (laughs) Written in your DNA. Oh my goodness. I found Anton to be very candid and forthcoming about his struggles with his addiction to marijuana, my personal favorite, and his sex addiction and the damage to his family as a result. But if you have listened to this podcast at all before, you know that there's a silver lining. Anton shares how he has turned his life around and is now committed to helping others full time through his books, speaking engagements, and online social media presence. I'll leave links to all the ways you can connect with him in the show notes. He also shares how he got sober through a program called Celebrate Recovery. It's a Christian-based recovery program, and he now leads groups through his church. He actually does a much better job of explaining what the program is all about. So with that, please enjoy this podcast episode with Anton. Well, Antoine, thank you so much for joining me on the ODAT Chat podcast. I'm excited to be here. Thank you for having me. I'm really, really excited to share with you today. Oh, great. You know, and so the way we met, I just thought it might be fun for the listeners to hear how we met So I met a friend of yours through my own podcasting journey. Michael, your friend Michael, is a podcaster and he has a sales podcast. And actually, he was a guest before. And through our conversation, uh, we both discovered that we were both in recovery. And I found out he was in Celebrate Recovery. So he came on and educated me a little bit. And then he was like, I have a great friend. He wrote a book. You should totally have him on your podcast. So that's how we met. And here you are. Absolutely. Yeah, Mike, you know, when Michael told me about it, I was like, you know, he had asked, it, would that be something I would want to do is to come in and talk with me? I'm like, absolutely. Anytime you get someone that is willing to be transparent and open up about their struggles and how they've been able to overcome so that other people can do the same thing, I am all for it. And I just absolutely love, love, love sharing my testimony and how, uh, how God has been able to help me overcome my own personal struggles. Uh, because I know that for me personally, there was a time where I didn't think uh, anybody else understood what I was going through. Mm-hmm. And so I had this this dark season when I thought it was just me by myself. But when I started to venture out and hear other people's testimony, you know, God began to work and say, hey, listen, you're not the only one that's going through it. And right. so anytime I have a chance, I'm so, so excited to do just that. 
Well, I, I certainly appreciate you taking the time out today, and I'm, I'm looking forward to hearing about your story. Um, but before we jump into it, typically the way I start out is by having people talk a little bit about what they do professionally. Actually, you know, I used to start, I used to start by saying, describe what you look like and tell me how old you are. Okay. <laughs> but then I was like, is that rude? But I've been doing it so long, maybe we'll just keep going. <laughs> And it's so fun. Well, now with now the technology, you don't even have to ask people to describe what they look like anymore. You can see, you know. I know. That's right. Well, this is just the audio version. You and I are chatting. I can see that's, you. That's true. But yeah, yeah. That's true. <laughs> I'm not sharing that part. But maybe you can just tell me how old you are and what you do professionally. So I am 32 years young. Still. Uh, my birthday is actually coming up in July. I'm a 7-Eleven um, baby. I tell, people, I, I tell people that uh, they started a chain of uh, convenience stores. <laughs> In honor in of honor my birth, of your, yeah, yeah. So if you tell if you go to Seven Eleven, say, "Hey, I know Antoine Anderson," and you know they give you a free uh, uh, Slurpee on Seven Eleven. Yeah, <laughs> that's what I tell people all the time. But yeah, so I'm 32 years old. I'll be 33 uh, this year. Uh, professionally, well, I mean, I guess the shortest version of what I do uh, is I serve full time at my at my ministry, my church uh, where I attend. Um, I also am a author by trade. I have a book, actually, a couple books out that I've I've written. I'm in the process of releasing at least two more before the end of this year. Uh, I also do business coaching and development with companies, corporations, uh, and then I do individual coaching and development on a one-on-one -on -one level. And uh, it's just really like mentoring, honestly, and discipling. Um, and then I do a lot of teaching, a lot of uh, facilitating of groups and stuff like that. And so my uh, schedule is pretty full, to say the least. Not to mention, I'm a father of two children, one, uh, Antoine Jr., who's 10, and then Aaliyah, Anderson, who is eight. And then my beautiful wife of 12 years, wow. I'm a husband to her as well. So yeah, we, we have a lot of little things going on here and there around this camp. <laughs> a couple of things. Yeah, that ought to keep you busy. Right. Very good. And I did read the book that you sent me, Bargain Basement Jesus. Uh-huh. That was awesome. Oh, of, yeah. Yeah, that was really, was that your first one or your second one? That was my first one. My first okay. one. That was my first book. Yeah, and it was it was kind of amazing how that even happened because I'm not well I can't say that I didn't like to write mm -hmm. and I never thought that I would uh, would ever do anything like that and it just mm -hmm. it just kind of just happened you know and, and it was one of those organic things that happened. Well, that's amazing. I'm I'm in the process of writing myself and it can be it can be a painstaking journey. So t the the fact that you have two, I just applaud you. I think that's amazing. Congratulations on on the release Appreciate of both that. those Thank books. You. That's a big deal. Okay, well, let's start out with a little bit about your background, like where you grew up and what your family was like, because I think it's so interesting to hear about people's backgrounds. I think for those listening, you know, we each relate to the, like the way we grew up and family experiences. And even though maybe things on the outside might be a little bit different, I feel like the feelings are all the same, right? There's always Absolutely. those commonalities within family. So um, tell me a little bit about your parents. Well, my parents, they um, they had me and my brother very young. Let's see, my mom must have been 16 when she had my brother. Uh, and I was the second oh, Okay, you're the second older one? brother. Yeah, I'm the oh, second okay. older. And my mother was, she had to have been 19 when she had, by the time she had me, uh, her and my father. And me and my older brother, we are the only uh, siblings that have the same mother and father. Uh, okay. And so my dad, when I was very young, I don't even really remember him leaving I just remember him coming back, but he went to the army and he, he spent some time serving uh, in the army. And my mom and he were married for a short period of time. Uh, but when he left, I, I believe, and I remind you that I was young, but I believe the story goes is that when he left, they kind of just grew apart, uh, ended up getting a divorce. And, you know, she remarried and my father remarried as well. And so I grew up in a uh, an environment with two different households. Mm -hmm. And as you can imagine, as a kid, that can be somewhat confusing. Uh, my mm -hmm. father was military, you know, very structured, very disciplined. Uh, my mother, not so much. Uh, she lived a, a different life. She enjoyed uh, in, uh, having fun. Um, one of her, matter of fact, about her husband that she married after my father, he actually was a drug dealer. Uh, your, he worked. He worked. Your my mother's. Stepfather. Oh, yeah. okay. He worked for the uh, the railroad station, but he also was a drug dealer. So, needless to say, seen a lot of stuff. Uh, seen a lot, a lot of stuff. You know, drugs, alcohol, and things of like that nature were very close to me as it relates to my environment. And so, as a young kid, I, I dare I say, was forced to grow up faster than probably would have liked to. 
but of definitely course. was exposed to some things. One of my, my struggles is uh, sex addiction. And I, I seen my first pornography at the age of four. Oh. And so I remember that video just as like I'm seeing it right now. And so, right. like I said, I was exposed to quite a few things as a, as a kid. So, Right. So let me ask you this. Okay, so your mom was super young when she had the two of you, so it's not surprising that they didn't stay Correct. together, right? I mean, they were just, Correct. they barely knew who they were, let alone absolutely. being yeah, capable absolutely. of picking a, a good spouse. But that's interesting that, so your mother, part was she supporting the family and your stepdad was using drugs and dealing with stuff? Was she participating in the drug use too? So she, you know, she started off with marijuana. She says to this day she hasn't used anything else, but we, being in addiction, know sometimes, you know, you try different things oh, no. here and there. <laughs> right. But, um, you know, she, it just was, the, I think my mother was more, she was more attracted to the lifestyle because um, mm -hmm. they had, they was very, he was very financially uh, astute, if you will. I mean, I can remember being a kid, playing in the closet and finding a big shoebox full of $100 bills. Wow. Uh, and so it's, it, it was the lifestyle. Uh, again, okay. I know she smoked marijuana and she, she drank alcohol and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. But my, my stepdad did, in fact, ended up being hooked on heroin. Uh, after wow. selling it for some time, he ended up using. And so that was a whole nother thing that happened that, uh, you know, just, some, just again, some things that we, we, we saw as kids. As kids, wow! And so, did your parent, did your uh, biological father live far away, or he, was he aware that that you guys were being exposed to this? You know, honestly, I'm not really so sure. To be honest with you, mm. he had he was over in Germany uh, for oh, some he time. Was. He was he was out of the country, and he was in the army. Okay, but well, 85 came, was he Desert Storm, or did he right, ever go? He, he got out right before because of his health. He couldn't go to the war, so he ended up coming back to the states. And when he came back to the states. You know, we've seen him frequently. I think my dad tells me all the time that one of the things that really made him want to get out of the service was because he came to visit and I didn't know who he was. Aww. Like I said, I was I don't really remember him leaving. And so right, when right. he was explaining to me who he was, I didn't know who he was. And so, as yeah, you can imagine, it's been heartbreaking. Can yeah, you, absolutely. Anton, can you imagine your kids not knowing you? I mean, you have these two kids. <laughs> Could you imagine them not knowing you? Nah, I couldn't. I couldn't imagine that. How heartbreaking that would have been. Right. Absolutely. And I mean, and I can understand why that would have prompted him to want to be free from, I don't want to say free from the military, but leave the military. And it just so happened his health, they, you know, with his health issues that he had, they, they discharged him with honorable discharge anyway. Mm -hmm. But I can imagine his heart was broken that his yeah. child didn't know what, so... That's rough. Okay, so, and I kind of know some of the answers to this. I feel like I'm cheating because I'm asking you questions. I know the answers too. But. That's okay. <laughs> so, um, you and your brother end up moving in with your father. Did your mother lose custody uh -huh. or how did that transition come about? So, when my dad re entered the picture, mm -hmm. he started to come around a lot. And okay. we just liked having him around and we just wanted to spend more time with him. He's a good and so, guy and took good yeah, care great of you. Guy. Yeah, and, absolutely. We had yeah. fun. He was disciplinary, but that's my, you know, that was dad. And so mm -hmm. um, what ended up happening was my mom and my stepfather had a child. Mm -hmm. And then uh, we, my mom and my stepfather adopted a child. And so now we're, we're a family of four. And so the shorter version is me and my brother had, I think we had spent the summer with my dad or something like that. And I think my brother initiated the conversation about possibly living with my dad. And so we actually had a conversation with my mom and some things that actually happened where my brother got into trouble at school and he got disciplined at home and he went back to school because he had a mark on his face and they called my dad and my dad came and got us. And then he was like, about, oh, hell no. About three months later, he ended <laughs> up my, my mom ended up just saying, listen, they want to live with you. You're in a stable place. Do you want them? He said, absolutely. I want them. I was in the third grade, and so we just transitioned and we moved from my father. Okay, so we kind of glossed over the uh, discipline thing. I'm sure you're friends with everybody now, and this put it, you put it all behind you, but it sounds like it was a traumatic experience the way your brother was, you know, disciplined. Um, I, you know, well, I'll be honest, we were bad kids. <laughs> <laughs> you had it coming. We've seen a lot. We did a lot, and we, you know, we behaved, misbehaved. Okay. I mean, I, I was in kindergarten. In first grade, I got kicked out of a school. You yeah. know, I would just, it just was, we was trouble kids. But what ended up happening was my brother got in trouble at school mm -hmm. and we had bunk beds. Mm -hmm. And so when my mom was whooping him, <laughs> he jumped on top of the bunk bed 
And when she swung at him to hit him, he gra- he, he reached for the belt. And when he reached for the belt, she accidentally hit him in his face. It was nothing intentional. She accidentally. Oh, okay. Oh, for some reason, what? I just assumed it was the uh, stepdad that was disappointed. No, no, no. It was your mom. You know, as crazy as it may sound, when my dad came back on the scene, my stepfather stopped disciplining us. <laughs> oh, imagine that. <laughs> right, yeah, he, he, he didn't. Prob- Do you think he was afraid of your biological father or intimidated, maybe? He probably was. He I don't know, you know, because my stepfather was a big man of stature. Okay. But my dad, my dad is a is a tough guy. Both of them sound pretty tough, to be honest. Right. And so I, I think it. it been do you think it was like a mutual respect thing? I think so. Yeah. I okay. think that's the was. I think oh, that's what okay. it was. Let's call it that. <laughs> <laughs> I don't, I'm not trying to start a fight in your family. <laughs> nah, that, yeah, nah, yeah. So it, it so it wasn't like um, she okay. really wasn't like overly abusive at all. I mean, okay. we got spankings, but it just so happened that at that exact moment he got hit okay. in the face and he went to school. My mom hit me in the face, and okay. yeah, it was it was a mess. All bad. Okay, so you go move in with your dad, and uh, your father's household is peaceful and structured and, and structured. Okay. <laughs> Not yeah, peaceful. Structure. Yeah. Structure. Well, it, it was, it was just a different environment. Okay. Compared was it to far my mom. away from your mom or did you guys have to change schools? We actually, we were, it was a blessing that we did not even have to change schools. Oh, wow. My father had a house built in the same district where we were already attending. Just so, so that, yeah. just for you guys, so that you wouldn't uh-huh. have to. That was specifically for us, yeah. Oh, what a good guy! That was specifically so we wouldn't have to change schools, stay close and to mom, stay close, yeah. And we literally, we used to be able to ride our bikes about twenty minutes to my mom's house. That's awesome. Yeah, that's how close they were. Yeah, he sounds like a really good dad. And then I understand that your mom becomes, she finds God and starts going to mm-hmm. church and. Mm-hmm. And sends you, I called it Jesus camp, but I don't know what it really That's is. What Jesus camp. <laughs> Jesus imagine, camp imagine, a, a, imagine a kid from urban, an uh, urban part of the city. Uh-huh. I'm sorry, what, to, what city did you grow up in? Kansas City, Missouri. I, I'm, I'm surprised city, I didn't Missouri. even mention that. Yeah, but Kansas well, City, you know, Missouri. I forgot to ask you because I, I read it and then um, I forgot to ma- ask you that. But okay, so Kansas City, Missouri is where you grew up. Not, not, not to be confused with Kansas City, Kansas. Right. That will start a fight. <laughs> start a fight yeah, Uh-oh. what sports team there. do you like then oh it's the chiefs the chiefs and the, we all love the same sports teams chiefs <laughs> royals but it's just a bridge and some water and we say they over there and we over here let's leave it at that right <laughs> let's leave it at that okay. but no um yeah so i a young urban kid from kansas city missouri okay um grew up in in some areas that were sort of tough not not like the you know not too terribly bad but it was just urban okay. um and when i go to this like you said this jesus camp <laughs> And during that time, like, like, it was Lake of, the, Lake of the Ozarks. I'm not for sure if you're familiar with the Ozarks at all. Down I've in the southern seen part the of show, the show, the Ozarks. <laughs> so it's something similar <laughs> it's to that. Yeah. Okay, okay. Yeah. And in Missouri during that time, there was still this racial tension. Okay. Uh, when Wait, I was coming are, up. Are we uh, talking like 95? We're talking about 95, 96, okay. um, 97. Not to the point where, you know... It's segregated, but it, there was some racial tension. Okay. And so you have this, this urban kid coming to this Jesus camp okay. with a lot of Caucasians. So was it right predominantly, off, predominantly it white? Predominantly, yes, it was. And there were just a few, a few other. Were there like other races, like Mexicans or Asians, or? It was it was blacks, a few blacks, handful of blacks, and, and predominantly uh, whites. Oh, there okay. Were, so I was I was a little uncomfortable to say the least. Yeah, and but you were coming from a school that was predominantly black. The school that I went to, so the so when I was a kid, I went to a school that was predominantly black. My okay. mom moved into a different area. When she moved to the, that area, I went to a different school called Dobbs Elementary. I got kicked out of Dobbs because okay. of my behavior. Okay. And then I ended up being at a school called Westridge, which which was in a suburban part of the city, which was more predominantly white than it was black. Okay. But I, I was just getting there. To, so, to that. I, you know, I don't know a lot of, I don't know a lot about this. So when you go to um, a school that's predominantly white, does that start that feeling of being separated or being different or, you know what I mean? Because oh, I, there's that, it, it, 
there's a sorry to keep talking but no, that's okay, that's okay. I, i'm curious because it doesn't seem to matter i'm a half mexican half white girl in a predominantly white area there is always like a feeling of being a little bit different and you know what i mean and so uh, you know what i mean so you're going to I this do. school do you feel that sense of having to hold back who you really are and feeling different and trying to blend in and well, for me personally, I can't speak for every person in this situation, but for me in that situation, what ended up happening was that I felt as though there were times that I was treated in a way that was unjustly and it was outside of my control. And so do you have I, an example, like, for instance, pre- uh, preferential, if you will, mm-hmm. uh, treatment of some of the white kids. Um, okay. If something happened, I was probably going to get the blame for it. Really? OK. Yeah. And so it's like, OK, let's say if we're both wrong, if we're both wrong, I'm the one that's wrong. He, the only reason why he's wrong is because he's responding to my wrongness, if that makes sense. OK, I, I, I can remember just as clear as yesterday it was a young guy who me and him was really we was good friends at one particular time. And we had gotten into a verbal argument over something like an eraser or something. They pulled both of us out of the class. They took us in a room to sit down to do some type of mediation. He said one thing. I said another thing. He got the preference. I did not. Meaning you got punished and he didn't? Correct. Wow. Correct. And so I felt like at at times I would feel as though regardless of what I did, I was going to get in trouble anyway. Okay. So there was was a short stint that I said, you know what, if I'm going to get in trouble anyway, I might as well do it. Right, right. I get it. Yeah. I totally get that. And it sounds like you, (laughs) it sounds like you were, um, yeah, that, I think that would be really hard. (laughs) Yeah, and, and it, as I as I grew from grade to grade, yeah. um, I started to see more people that looked like me. Okay. However, we I mean we all kind of felt had the same feeling of and and well we just we're talking about it, so I'm gonna just go ahead and say it. I'm not one who, because my my wife is Native American, and my children are Native American and Black. I'm not one who desires to pull that pro black card if you if you know what I'm saying. Mm-hmm. I think a person should be judged by their character like Martin King the Kid said Absolutely. in their heart. It doesn't yeah. matter if you're black, white right, or indifferent. Um, but I have had experiences where I have been mistreated because of the color of my skin. And it is unfortunate. Um, mm-hmm. it, it did for a long time shape the way I thought about things, especially when I was still living in in Kansas City. Mm-hmm. Because again it's so much more definite there. When I moved out here to Phoenix, Arizona there were some things that I was exposed to just interracial relationships. And seeing so many of them, it was like, wait a minute. Back home, if, you know, individual was in an interracial relationship, it was kind of like you getting the side eye when you walk into the store. Was it scandalous? Really? Yeah. Really? Oh, Even my goodness. Now? Oh my goodness! Oh, you know, he, 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 ca- he he would a black he would a white girl. You get, look at him. He, you know he dating that white girl. I don't know why he dating that white girl. I mean, those are types of things. He would that, say that out loud. Yeah. Oh my god! And you will get mistreated because of who you were with. I'm so I, sorry like that I said, my, 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 my wife my, my wife is Native American, mm-hmm. and I was I went to preach at a place in Missouri in 2015. Before my wife came, I was there because I was doing a, a, a book tour. Mm-hmm. So I went to a, I went to a, a church uh, that I knew some individuals and they were so happy to see me. Hey, you know, and then what ended up happening was the next time I came back, like a week later, my wife was with me. And when she was with me, those same individuals that were speaking to me turned the other way. No, absolutely. That is so weird. I just don't get it. And I don't know if it's because I grew up in California and people are like super liberal here, but that just still to this day blows my mind that people are like that. We're talking, we're talking, and, but and this is the reality. It was was African Americans who did that to me. Oh, okay. I'm surprised. Yeah. <laughs> no, no, no. It was African Americans who did that to me. It what, wasn't. What is that about? Why are you with a, a woman who's not black? Why do they care? I mean, what? I don't, okay. It's, Maybe that's. It's, a... that... <laughs> I'm t- but that's it's how it, it is. It's, it's real. That that is the real thing. That's people a, okay. will frown that frown their face upon you. Because you're not with someone who looks like you. And it's not just white folks, white folks who do it. It's black folks who do that, too. I just that's funny. I just assumed that you were talking about white people or being. No, no, no. (laughs) Okay. Okay. They're not the only ones. They're not the only ones. Got it. Okay. We all crazy. That's what it boils down to. (laughs) We all all look cray cray. Absolutely. We all crazy. That's what it boils down to. Okay. 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 We should probably talk about drug. 
Where sure. are we right now? Right? I don't know. It's, yeah. It's, <laughs> sorry. I, I just have, I just always have like a thousand questions for everything. So I didn't mean to take you down a rat hole, but, um, because really what I was curious about, and I didn't ask you this. So it sounds like you're, we got all the way up to, well, we got all the way up to, uh, when you're with your wife and stuff, but when, where did the, where, when was the first time you took a drug or drank alcohol? And I understand that, like, you know, you mentioned that you saw a lot of drugs and you saw porn at a super young age. But when did you start? When did you start using? Well, my, my first drug of choice, if you will, was pornography. OK. Uh, I had access to pornography like a person could breathe air. Okay. I have a grandfather who he literally had magazines, uh, videos. <laughs> ew, ew, ew. Not, not of himself. Not no, of himself. no, no, no. I know. Oh. I know. But. But just, like hundreds of videos. I just got a visual of grandpa with a bunch of porn. I was like, Ugh. I can remember grandpa used to fall asleep on his bed watching porn. And we would walk past the room and you could see it on the TV screen. We were just standing in stand the doorway just watching. But he had, he had hundreds of videos wow. and would never know if one or two was missing. Um, yeah. Not to mention the internet was introduced during this time. Now we had dial up. It was a little slower than high speed internet. <laughs> right. Nonetheless, we still used it. Um, right. And so, so pornography was my first drug of choice, if I can say that. It was a, sure, it was a way yeah. to escape trying to, it's about you know, instead out. of yeah, checking out. That was it. Just checking out. Sounds like grandpa uh, was wanting, checking out. Grandpa was grandpa kind of still checking out, but <laughs> but yeah. So it was a way to get away. Okay. I admired the men in the video because they had women who looked up to them. So I thought, of course, that's a, oh, okay. a warped way of thinking. I know. But it's a and, and, world, yeah. yeah. And so that, so that was my first drug of choice. I had I smoked marijuana uh, socially, and I hate to say that that's probably acceptable, but that's the reality. It was socially probably when I was at the age in like seventh or eighth grade, I first tried marijuana. Okay, yeah, me too. Uh, Junior high was the experimental year. <laughs> and and I, I remember saying that I would never smoke marijuana because I I seen the effects that it did to people around me, and it was so crazy because. I, re- I played. I was very, very competitive for, in basketball. Mm. Really, really good play, basketball player. And I would always say I'm not going to smoke or do any drugs because I don't want to mess up my basketball career. It was to the point where high school players that I would play with, mm. when I would see that they were smoking marijuana, my heart would break. Like I just would oh, be yeah. just oh, okay. strong. And then oh, took. You yeah, know, I just distra- realized is that Michael is a is a basketball player too, right? Yes, he is. Do yeah. you guys play basketball together? Some sometimes we play. We haven't played in a while. You guys go to the same church, right? Uh huh. We do. Okay. All right. Just yeah. curious. All right. Sorry. Yeah. Continue. No, that's okay. <laughs> no, so, okay. So, so um, you saw these guys who were competitive basketball players. They were smoking weed, and it was derailing weed. because they were on the track, the fast track for college, right? Yeah. These guys were really. I mean, I've played competitively against some guys who currently right now are in the NBA, and guys yeah. who were older than me played better than some of those guys, but they allowed their lifestyle to get them off track to the point where they didn't make it. That and so when I was a kid, I was like, I'm not doing that. If I found out one of my little, my heroes, neighborhood heroes is what I used to call them, smoke marijuana, I'll start following somebody else because I'm like, you know, I'm, I'm not going to participate in that. But then peer pressure ended up getting to me. And okay. by the time I was in, in middle school and it was like, man, just try it. All you got to do is just try it. And so I just tried it. I didn't like it initially. Um, I think I think the first time I smoked, I was with my older brother, nonetheless. But I, I tried it a little bit. I really didn't care for it. When I got in high school, I tried it again, and I just put it down because it just wasn't something that I really enjoyed doing. Okay. But were, they, the, but were the boys like uh, like your friends? Were they were they drinking beer and on the weekends or? I didn't hang around those guys. In high school, I, no. I I have one friend that smoked marijuana often, but they already knew I didn't smoke. Okay. And so it wasn't like, you know, Antoine, you know, it, in fact, there were some individuals that would say, man, you don't need to smoke or you don't need to be doing anything. You need to just focus on your basketball. Oh, don't okay. do not do anything else. Mm-hmm. But yeah. So in high school, the, again, the only drug of choice at that time became on a consistent basis was pornography and sex. Yeah. I didn't even start drinking until after I graduated high school. Okay. Uh, that was an, that was another one that I said I would never do uh, because I seen how it affected it had on some of my family members, specifically my father. Um, and how he struggled with alcohol. So I said, Your you know what? I'm biological not... father? Biological dad, yeah. You know what? Alcoholism is is, uh, is strong in the military. Well, I t- my grandmother, his mom struggled, and she struggled all the way up until her recently. My father now celebrates going on two years of being, sobri- of, so of being sober. Right? Absolutely. Oh, that's so great. 
there's a, there's a, there's a powerful testimony behind that because he, okay. he 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 became a believer. Mm-hmm. Once he became a believer, he really started changing his life. And then he, you know, he said he had to give up the alcohol. So that's, that ain't nothing but God working right there. I hear you. Yeah. So, I mean, so that's my awesome. first, and I turned to alcohol uh, after a heartbreak, believe it or not. Me and a girlfriend broke up. Mm-hmm. Uh, I had, And this this is when I had decided to stop playing basketball and just to pursue really her, to be honest with you. Mm-hmm. And then we broke up and I, you know, started to drink. And then I ended up moving down to Arizona. You were um, depressed after your breakup oh, and um, absolutely grieving, crying. You know, the, how you old know, were you? Our, I think I was seventeen, eighteen. Oh, that's the worst. Your first, yeah, 17, first 18. love. And I, I had even moved. I had moved out of my dad's house right after. Let's say I graduated in May. I think I moved out of my dad's house that following February, following January. Mm-hmm. So I was like 18 years old. I was living by myself. I had I was working with Fed, FedEx. I was oh, doing really good. Hustling. Yeah. And then got my heart broke and all everything else <laughs> went to pieces. I, know. I understand. Um, and then in 2009, I um, read in your book that there was a tragic accident, but you don't really elaborate in the beginning about what happened. Can you tell me the story? What happened? Yeah, and I, I kind of shielded it a little bit in the book because of the uh, sensitivity of someone else. Um, it but okay. it's, it, it it has since, you know, they have since processed it, grieved it, if you will. Okay. Um, but my, my older brother had a, a child who passed away at two months old. Oh, my God. From uh, oh from SIDS, yeah. Oh, and, from SIDS. Okay. Oh, how sad. That was a trying, a trying season for us. Yeah. There was a trying season, yeah. Oh my goodness, I'm so sorry. So, okay, let me just kind of go back and recap. So we go to Jesus camp, and <laughs> <laughs> and then and you find God, but you go through that period like we all do. I did the same thing, you know. I found mm-hmm. God at 14. I went to a Billy Graham crusade and was saved. Oh wow! And, <laughs> yeah. But well, then, see, this is the crazy. This, this is the I can't say crazy. This is the most amazing thing for me. I remember being at the camp and it was a father and a son who was over our cabin. Uh-huh. I got into a fight. Just, yeah. there was that, that was me. I got into a fight. Okay. He pulled, the son pulled me out on this like little dirt road that was out there. And he was talking to me, telling me how much God loved me, Jesus loved me. And I'm like, dude, please, you know, I, I don't just believe that. Yeah. And so then he just kept telling me. And then it, I remember he got to a point and he asked me, did I want to accept him. And I was like, well, you know, kind of what do you mean? So he broke it down to me. And I said, well, if he loves me that much, yeah, I want to accept him because remember at that time in my life, I really didn't, I I knew about Jesus because my grandmother would always cuss somebody out and say, we're going to have, I'm going to pray for, pray for them. And she would always pray for them in Jesus name. That's the only thing I knew about Jesus. (laughs) She would cuss them out and then pray for him. Pray for you in Jesus name, you know? And so. (laughs) Have your feelings, pray. Okay. I get it. (laughs) Right. And so, you know, he, he I remember inviting Christ in my heart and I remember actually seeing him come into my heart. I remember seeing it oh. like it was yesterday. Right. And so ever since that time, what happened was any time I messed up, mm-hmm. I kid you not, I would always be convicted. What does that mean? Always, meaning that he would be in me telling me that's, that's wrong. wrong. OK, you ain't supposed to be doing that. OK, you I knew that be- once you I, know better. Yeah. Once you know better, if you and make the I, I would go to the store and with my with my friends, Seven mm-hmm. Eleven or IGA, we were running there, steal some candy or something like that. I ran into Seven Eleven one time trying to steal. Everybody got out. I tripped and fell. <laughs> and I feel like God, God he said it, his conviction says that, you know, if you go to court, you're you're convicted. So the conviction says you ain't supposed oh. to do that. That's why you got caught. Got it. When it was IGA stole a, a hot pickle, got home. I locked my keys in the house. So I had to wait. <laughs> And God said, you ain't supposed to be stealing. That's what you get for stealing. Did, so you, be, did was, you say a hot pickle? A hot pickle. I love it. <laughs> I've never heard of such a thing. Okay, you heard of a hot pickle? Hot pickle? No. Like you spicy hot, spicy hot? Yeah, a hot pickle, like a deal pickle. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> and a hot... Wow. Okay. I'm, a, more, I'm a little bit more country than I realized. Yeah, a hot pickle. We're going to we're gonna have to get you outside sometime. Get you experience <laughs> life. You have not experienced life until you have eaten a hot pickle. A hot pickle. That is going on the bucket list. Okay. Busted for the hot pickle. Totally get it. 
Um, and so my, so my whole life I've had, God has always been speaking to me, even when I've done things that was not correct. And it's been a lot of that. All right, now I, I mean, gotta ask uh, you something about, I gotta ask you about yeah. something because this was my experience too. So I grew up in the church. Uh huh. I wanted to be good, but I found myself smoking weed with the pastor's daughter all the time. Uh -huh. What was going on? Do you feel like that was just like an adolescent thing or I don't know. I, for me, I felt bad about who I was and I was trying to be anybody but me. And so I would conform and be the chameleon and I was trying to manage my feelings. And even though I was at church, there was like that disconnect. I was still behaving so badly. Why didn't God fix me? Anton? Well, this is, this is what Paul said. <laughs> Well, no, this is the thing. So, so when we when we when we become believers and we accept Jesus in our heart, mm -hmm. Scripture tells us that we get a deposit. Deposit is the Holy Spirit. Okay. The Holy Spirit we get, and we, we're sealed into the day of redemption. Ultimately, saying until the day He comes back. So we have this deposit. We're sealed. We cannot lose that deposit. Okay. What happens is He, the Holy Spirit that lives in us, has to continue to change us from the inside out. He tells us that he has to continue to change the way we think, the way that we see things. And so it's not an instantaneous thing. Some people believe if you are saved or if you have a relationship with Jesus, you shouldn't do any bad things. Paul said in the book of Romans, he said, even though I know to do right, the very thing I know I shouldn't do, I find myself doing. Yeah. Because it is a process. And we have to continue to have our mind renewed. And if we're not around, if we're not around the right individuals mm. or we're not in constant relationship with him, like my book talks about, he desires to have a relationship. If we're not in a relationship and speaking with him, mm -hmm. we're going to keep thinking the same way. And so we'll have this war within us. Like, like you mentioned, I can relate. I know this is what I shouldn't be doing, but this is what I find myself doing. And then after I do it, I feel so guilty. I feel so ashamed. I feel like I'm not worthy. I feel so filthy and, thir and dirty. Yeah. And I and it's because I have that conviction that okay. I know that it's not right. He's telling me it's not right, and he won't allow me to just stay there. Got it. I love that. You know, and you said um, the mind needs to be renewed. You know, uh, for me, part of my um, practice of um, maintaining my sobriety is I continually go to meetings and. I am of a service to other women who are coming up after me who are wanting to take steps and things like that. And it does keep my mind um, on the solution, you know. Absolutely. So I, I totally get that process. So walk me through how you celebrate recovery. So when my, when my nephew passed away, uh, we ended up coming to the church that we're members at now. And I came to the funeral and I was completely drunk. Like... <gasps> Drunk at the funeral? 100. I was drunk at the funeral. Okay. Straight. I mean, I'm straight. not judging. I'm just, I thought you were. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, no. I was all the way drunk. Like, oh. to the point where I was in there cussing. I was drunk. <gasps> yeah. Were you mad at God? Absolutely. Mm. Oh, absolutely. I was mad at God. I was mad at the pastor because I'm like, the pastor didn't want us to have no re uh, reviewing at the end. So I was mad at the pastor. I was mad at God. I was drunk. Did you drunk. say reviewing? So, yeah, so the way that we do, we, but I, I've learned to understand why this is now. But at that time, we almost didn't have the funeral at the church because at the beginning of the funerals, what typically happens is you get to see the body. They close oh. the casket. They have the service. And at the end of the service, they open it back up to see the, for the final viewing. Well, okay, this, church says, this church says they didn't, they didn't do that. Once they closed the casket, it was it. And so I was like, well, if we can't do that there. We ain't coming there. Well, my mom and my brother, they decided to still have the services. So I was upset about that. Okay. And I was upset about God and God as well. He's two months old. You know, why would you take him? He just got here. All these things. Well, long story short is that while I was sitting in the church drunk from drinking Hennessy all that morning, the pastor was Sad. preaching, but he preached me sober. Really? Literally, the, the, I'm telling the Holy Spirit is real. He literally pre to the point where I can't even remember what he said. I just remember like my body shook and I was sober. You were stone cold and so sober. I, I was stone cold sober. And I'm like, oh my God, what is, you know, what is this? And so I told my wife, you know what? Let's come back to visit this church later to mm -hmm. see if, you know, see what's really going on. And so what ended up happening is we end up joining. I talk about this a lot in my book about the process of that. And how, you know, it, it was still this battle. I still was going to the club. I still was drinking. Uh, I still was struggling with that. But we, I, I surrounded, no, let me rephrase that. God surrounded me with people 
who were able to love me through my mess, who wasn't judgmental, who wasn't telling me how bad of a person I was because I had a struggle, who held me accountable, but they still supported me. And so it came to a place where I was serving, I was in classes, and my pastor said, hey, you know, I want you to come out to, to California with me to go to this church called Saddleback. They have this program that I think that you can help me support. So I'm like, OK, cool. I can do that. I can go help other people. No problem. I go to the church. I think it, was, it must have been on the, the first or the second day of this conference. And I mean, to tell you, they had some testimonies. And I was like, wait a minute. I can't do this for somebody else. I need to do this for me because I heard my story oh, at the summit. Oh, you heard your story. I heard you my story. Like- You identified at the heart level. Absolutely. And ever since then, I've been a part of Celebrate Recovery. I still go to, in fact, I'm in the middle of a a step study right now. I just believe that the the principles that are taught, you talk about how you go to meetings. I believe that it's a life journey. If there's no graduation, as long as we're living, we're going to have things that come up. We have to learn how to have the right disciplines in place to prevent us from going back to our addiction. And so I'm, I'm a firm, firm believer in that. In fact, uh, as I teach at, at Suburb Recovery, I tell people when you look up the definition of recovery, it's a return to a normal state of health, mind and strength. And so I celebrate my return to a normal state of health, mind and strength, because what happened was as I was a kid, things happened to me that disrupted this normality, if you will. And it created this new normal that is not what God has designed for me. He desires for me to respond to my emotions a certain way. He desires for me to respond to situations a certain way. But until I was able to go through Celebrate Recovery, I couldn't return to that normal state. I was in this paradox, if you will, believing that certain things should have happened. And it's a continual process right. that is like peeling back an onion even to this day. No, And how long has it been? It, so I first started going to Celebrate Recovery in 2013. So it's been okay. five years. It's been five years. That's yeah. great. Yeah. Yeah. And I am of the mind that it. That I continue to go to. I, I, um, I got sober in 94 and I can tell you that it is a process. And because we, you know, it's so interesting that you talk about returning to balance because when I first got sober, I never, I never felt like I had actually been there. You know what I mean? It wasn't like, yeah. it was like a, a new place. It wasn't, I wasn't returning. I was showing up for the first time. <laughs> right. Yeah. And, it but, uh, it, it is in our, it is in our, well, I'll speak for myself. It is in my, within my mindset. My default is, is like negative thinking. And, and so that's why I really keyed into the mind needs to be renewed. And, and, um, Absolutely. and that you found that at Celebrate Recovery that, your community supports you that way. And see, the thing, I, I became a, before I found CR, I became a drive drunk. And I, I didn't understand that terminology until I was there. So I wasn't Tell drinking anymore. what that anymore. means to you. What, what does a drive so, drunk mean to you? So for me, I wasn't drinking anymore, but I was still angry. I still okay. had these, this, this mindset. My marriage was still on the rocks because although I wasn't participating in alcohol, I'm still not dealing with my stuff. Right. I'm, not still, I'm still not dealing with my junk. So it's almost like we prefer you to drink. So at least you'll be out of it for a minute, you know, but I, I had stopped drinking. Right. I was still yeah, angry. Right. I still was hurting. I still was, I, I wasn't a very pleasant person to be around sometimes. You know, mm-hmm. I was very negative. My wife once told me that she had, she felt like she had to walk on eggshells Egg and she never, yeah. never really knew where I was at. And in my mind, I'm thinking, well, good. You need to be on your toes. You know, how messed up thinking is that for a husband to say to his wife? But that's what I believe. Mm-hmm. And so I was not, a, I wasn't drinking, but I was, I was a dry drug. That's my, that was my definition. Got it. The, okay. So you were not in balance. You weren't happy. You were angry. Uh-huh. You were still, you know, you were suffering, you know, you were yeah. still hurting. You were still suffering. Yeah. yeah. And you know, that saying, you know, hurt people, hurt, hurt people. people. Yeah. Yeah. And so, and I loved what you said earlier about, um, you found people who weren't judging you, that they were kind to you. And it's, and it's at the end of the day, it's love that heals us, right? Absolutely. I don't need anybody to tell me that I'm a horrible person. I already know that. And I'm battling with you. Right. I'm battling battling with you. battling with you. Right. That's one of the things that I really, you know, I kind of catch some flack sometimes from some of my brothers and sisters, if you will, because I'm, I'm in the mind to believe that Jesus loves everybody. Yeah. I don't care what you're doing. In fact, Scripture says that for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. He didn't say for God so loved Israel. He didn't say for God so loved people who do right. He didn't say for God so loved people who go to church or read the Bible or anything like that. He said for God so loved the world that he gave. And so if he loved you enough to give his son, 
then what am I doing demonstrating my how much I think that what you're doing is wrong? I need to demonstrate love to you. I need to be there to love you because mm-hmm. he loves you. And if I truly follow him, I have to love you as well. And some people feel like sometimes, you know, you, you, you know, you're just too nice to people or you need to be telling that individual. I'm like, listen, trust me when I tell you people understand that they're not doing everything perfect because I, I know that I'm not. And they don't need to hear how bad they're doing. Sometimes they need to be able to hear, you know what? I know you are where you are, but guess what? God loves you. If something's inside of you that he has invested in you, that he's trying to, to water almost like a seed to bring forth, bring forth some fruit, people need to be encouraged. And maybe that love will get them out of whatever condition that they're in. Absolutely. I feel like that's the only thing that really makes people change is love. Yeah. Yeah. No, that's beautiful. So tell me, um, I, I learned a little bit through Michael about what Celebrate Recovery was like, um, but maybe you can maybe elaborate and share what your experience has been. I've only known, I, I've never participated um, in, in Celebrate Recovery. I'm, I've done traditional 12 steps where I go to both women's meetings and I go to mixed meetings. Um, they don't let me go to men's meetings, oddly <laughs> enough. But, um, yeah, I didn't fight not do that. Yeah, they don't like that. I did know one woman who was crazy enough to talk her way into one, and I am so jealous. Really? Yeah. 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 We stay, stay and, clear of that. <laughs> yeah, oh, y'all, and, and y'all keep it separate, safe, right? It's a, sa- it's a safety thing. It's a safety because, thing, right? Absolutely. That's so, so I struggle with sex addiction, right? right? And let's say that I'm, ha- I'm having a weak moment. Right. And if I'm having a weak mo- moment and there's a woman who struggles with sex, sex addiction who's in the same group. <laughs> But she's but she's there to pr- to uh, pray on me, right? <laughs> she's there to I'm, pray on you. She said, <laughs> she said to okay. pray. Well, it's uh, oddly enough that it. happens. No, like, I know, I know that really happens, and it, by, yeah. and vice versa. Men go, some men go to meetings they do. looking for women who are vulnerable. Yeah. So I we, know it. yeah, we definitely we we start together with the like with the big group teaching. Mm-hmm. But after the teaching, we, we absolutely separate. Everybody's open share groups are separate. And, and sometimes they are uh, issue specific. The step studies are definitely separate. You, you will not I think find. That's like a fabulous idea. Yeah, because it's, yeah, it's, I've heard some horror stories and seen, I've actually seen some stuff like, hey, what are y'all doing? I know, I know. Listen, um, they say that uh, Alcoholics Anonymous is not the hotbed of mental health. <laughs> So, <laughs> I get it. Summer okay. cigarette. But I do, you know, I remember when I first got sober, I was 25 years old. I was platinum wow. blonde. I was, <laughs> I was very fit. Um, and the girls circled up and were like, watch out. <laughs> you need yeah. to stick with the women. So I did. And, I, and I'm grateful for that because over the years I've seen seen some things happen. People are weak and whatever. So not to, not to, um, beat a dead horse, but, uh, okay. So y'all keep it separate. That's super yeah. good. <laughs> y'all keep it separate. <laughs> yes, we do. Okay. Um, but so celebrate recovery is, is basically founded on the beatitudes of Jesus in Matthew chapter six, obviously oh, Matthew chapter five, excuse me. <gasps> and so every, right, right. How dare you? How dare you? Got it wrong. Right. Got it wrong. Yeah, you oh, got straight to hell you go. You right? made us a mistake. Right. And so, so the, the Beatitudes, you know, talking about happy are the, you know, those who are poor in spirit, mm-hmm. uh, happy are those who are, uh, happy are those who are mo- who mourn for they shall be comforted, happy are the meek, so on and so forth. And so each one deals with the actual step. Uh, and so okay. the way that it's, the way that it's set up is that each step is connected to one of the eight principles mm-hmm. and each step and each principle is connected to a scripture, a truth. Um, we, we make no you know, apologies about who we believe that a higher power is. We all believe Mm -hmm. that, you know, our sobriety and our recovery uh, comes through the power of Jesus Christ and the cross. Mm -hmm. Um, And so we really, we really speak from that perspective. I've had individuals come and say, you guys talk about this at the church. I was like, well, where else should we talk about it? You know, we're struggling. Like for instance, I I did a, I I did a a, a small section. I I guess, it was a part of a lesson I was teaching and I felt led to speak about masturbation. You should have seen You should have seen the faces in the room in this <laughs> church, this person who's teaching this minister, pastor, whatever they call me, he's talking about masturbation. <laughs> well, the reality masturbation is an issue. Yeah. You know? And so I, I talked about 10 or 15 if minutes. about masturbation. too much. <laughs> well, wait a minute. 
okay, this is this this is what this is the reality. It's supposed to be a balance, right? <laughs> that ain't. But see, that will get us out of balance. Oh, Let me okay, why, got it. Let me why that's gonna get get it out of balance because we teach our bodies to pursue a feeling, okay. a climax. Okay. God created sex for husband and wife so that we can please each other. If I train my body to just chase this feeling, when I lay down with my spouse, my body is so used to going after this feeling that I can't please her anymore. It's all about pleasing myself. And so that's like if you lift weights and you got muscle memory, you get into that bed, you have muscle memory, and boom, it's over with for you and not for the other person because of how you have trained your body. Okay. Absolutely. And so I talked about that for like 15 minutes. And I'm telling you, there were some people in that, you could, some people want to run out of there. But the reality so was. uncomfortable. People are so, it's am, isn't it amazing how um, we can watch people get blown up or stabbed or killed or whatever. But God forbid anyone talk about masturbation or sex. Everyone freaks out. It is the weirdest thing because everybody has, it was people in there looking <laughs> like that. But do you know how many people came up to me afterwards? Oh my God, thanks for like, saying that. Yes. <laughs> and it wasn't, and it wasn't just men. And it wasn't yeah. just teenage boys. It was some women in there, too, yeah. that was really excited that I, that I spoke on that mm -hmm. because they struggle with that. Right, right. And I think so, for a lot of women, it also goes along with love addiction. I've seen uh -huh. women chase men in this idea of love that if they could just have the right man, and I've seen women trying to control that and mm -hmm. try to put somebody in a box that they don't belong in. and and not accepting somebody for who they are and just chase, like living in a fantasy. Absolutely. The idea, they, they're chasing this ideal of what this relationship looks like or what this love looks like. Yeah. We have a group for that too. Women who... Love uh, addiction. Uh-huh. Yeah. Oh, that's awesome. Yeah. yeah. And, yeah and it can be just as destructive because all, and, and we've been talking about a lot of different things, but at the end of the day, all these addictions end up with self-loathing, loss of hope, isolation, like being disconnected and just that utter feeling of sadness and loneliness. It can be so destructive. And that's why Celebrate Recovery for me is very integral, if you will, mm -hmm. because what we teach is that the one who desires to complete you, to heal you, to comfort you is our father. Right. We've all learned how to reach for these other things to mm -hmm. be comforted. They have a son. And this is a, there's no such thing as comfort food. There isn't. Nope. Mac and cheese is not comfort food. You want, but you want to know why it's not I'm comfort food? so confused. Why? <laughs> because, because what happens, you can uh, numb the feeling or the emotion, mm -hmm. but it's going to come back. You don't have to deal with that thing. Food was Listen. never meant to get, food was <laughs> never meant to comfort you. If nothing I'm getting else, like, that. Like ice cream and mac and cheese, some of that stuff can do more damage to your physical body. Yes. And you know what? That is a great segue into the other thing that we hop right on off that comfort food, huh? Yeah. Don't talk about that. Yeah. <laughs> you're, you're, hurt, you're hurting my feelings. <laughs> no, but we were talking earlier about counting the cost you have. It, yes. And it's a, and the language you use is very religious and which I appreciate because I grew up in the church and I understand what you're saying. But to translate that in sort of a secular way, you know, we talked about everything in life has a price tag, right? Correct. And the ice cream and the mac and cheese, that is buying something up front and, and delaying the cost, like, right? Like and then, credit. Like, yeah, on credit. And then for me, the price tag comes up in a way where suddenly like I'm uncomfortable like my clothes don't fit Absolutely, I yeah. am self-conscious in public I find myself adjusting my clothes and wondering like can anybody see this Absolutely. you know what I mean and I feel bad about who I am and I start to go down that road of comparing my who I am as a person on the inside Absolutely. against what other people are. and so it's just this vicious and cycle so, yeah, it's a vicious cycle. And, you know, it's important to, you know, as, as you were writing about in your book to count the cost, like as we make decisions to like in, in A, they talk about think it all the way through, uh huh. you know, and Very so simple. is that what counting the cost means to you? Like, what is it? How does that work? And how does that work in your life? So, for instance, the uh, the book, the focus of the book is really geared toward individuals who may uh, be struggling in their faith, 
who may uh, be on the fen- on the fence, if you will, of even becoming a believer or feeling like they're not worthy enough and understanding that don't believe the hype that says that once you become a believer in Jesus Christ that everything is perfect. There's a cost for the there's a cost for the joy, the peace. Uh, there's a cost to be pla- to be paid. Mm-hmm. So one of the ways that I can apply that to my life, like even right now, is that, for instance, I believe that God has continued to call me to to share the truth or to minister to, to the caring, uh, to preach the word, so on and so forth. So, so there are some things that I have to do in order for me to be prepared to do that. There's some things that I, 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 you know, I spend a lot of time reading. I spend a lot of time in prayer. I spend a lot of time in meditation. And instead of doing the quote unquote fun things in life that some people may be able to experience, because I recognize where he's calling me, I have to sacrifice some things because I believe that this is where he's leading me to. Same thing is, is for instance, being a husband, even counting the costs of being a husband. I, I, maybe I should write a chapter on that. But the reality is, you know, there are some things that I sacrifice to make sure that I am the best husband I can be. Mm-hmm. Well, an individual was uh, talking about uh, open marriages and, and, and swingers lifestyle and should believers do that? And, and I'm just one of I'm just one of the belief that the answer to that question is no, mainly because I have a hard enough time making sure I'm the best husband I can be for my wife that I couldn't have possibly imagined having multiple people. And so the cost of that is, yeah, I don't I don't go out. There's some certain things I just don't do because I want to make sure that my marriage is the priority of my life, that my marriage would be beneficial, my marriage would be effective. So I have to I have to pay that cost, if you will, by not doing certain things that some of my friends, single friends and even some married friends do that I just don't partake in. Right. Yeah. The price tag is too high. Cause, and you know, it's scary because you just never know how people are going to feel. You know, <laughs> boundaries are a funny thing. You don't know where they are until you cross them sometimes. True. Right. True. And, Very true. And um, sometimes, you know, just, you just don't know until it happens, but. And it's like, it'd be too late. Like, Oh, my bad. Yeah. Got and then what? Yeah. And then what? You know, how do you. You know, then the hurt, it's like, you you know, it's like that saying, you know, it's like once you squeeze the toothpaste out of the tube, it's really hard to get it back in. Absolutely. You know what I mean? So sometimes it's better to just, you know, be a little conservative and, and really dig deeper. Cause I think, you know, I've been married for a long time too. Uh, my husband and I have been together for probably about 23 years and we've had, we've raised small children. Little kids are hard on a marriage, you know? And, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and it can't, they can be, but what happens is it forces you to dig deeper inside. Right. And it, um, I think it, it, you know, makes it better in the long run, but it's, it's tricky. It's tricky, tricky to navigate because marriage is a marathon, right? You need to be Absolutely. able to, you may, need to be able to go to the distance and it's, it's tough to go to the distance if you're taking hits all the way along the path. And so. Listen, my, and my wife, and I thank God for her, she's taking a lot of hits uh, mm-hmm. from me. I, in my book, I share how you know I had to confess my adultery to her um, sometime after it was it was over with. But in order for us to experience healing and come to that place of true intimacy, you know, God said you need to tell her what happened, mm-hmm. and that has caused us even even that to grow closer. Um, we've had, we've had situations and circumstances where our finances were not the greatest. Um, I, t- I talk about you know when I you know resigned from a company and. And, and pursued other things, and we took a financial hit for that. But even through all of those things, there's no doubt in my mind that my marriage is going to last because we made it through some strong tests or some some hard tests. Mm-hmm. But it, like you said, it made us dig deep, yeah. and it brought our uh, bond a lot closer. And there's nobody in the world that I would prefer to uh, to share the rest of my life with. And I know things are going to get back on the uptick, if you will. Mm-hmm. And there's no one in the world that I would want to be able to experience the things that I know are coming our way than my wife. Yeah, no, that's beautiful. I'm so glad that you guys have been able to work through all that stuff. It takes a lot of courage. And, and at the end of the day, if there wasn't that love there, it wouldn't have been worth fighting for in the first place. So absolutely. Yeah, that's beautiful. Thank you so much for sharing that. Well, listen, we're, um, I'm hogging a lot of your time and (laughs) and I'm so grateful that you have, you know, you were able to come on and share all of that. Uh, I feel like I could ask you a thousand more questions. Um, maybe we'll have to do round two somewhere down the line. And uh, you I'm know what I'll do? Is, I was telling uh, Michael that I would go to a celebrate recovery meeting, and then we'd have more to talk about after that. So listen, the the summit, the big summit, is actually coming up in August, and it's Where? up in uh, Lake Forest. How far are you from Lake Forest, California? I have no idea. 
I oh, like it by San in Francisco. Like Orange County. Oh, Orange so, County area. Okay, so that's down south. It's in so, August. Yeah. It's in August. I don't know. I can email you the. Yeah, date. actually, yeah. Why don't you share that information with me, and I will put it in the show notes in case people who are interested in attending. That might be a great place to explore, Absol celebrate recovery. Is that a big absolutely. convention with a bunch of people? Because you will be introduced to the heart of it. Okay, um, yeah. Big conferences are always a lot of fun. Very inspiring. Yeah, shoot that over to me, and um, I'll put that in the show notes. And, yeah, listen, I'm going to put uh, links for your book up there. And how can people get a hold of you if they have, if they'd want to talk to you about maybe participating in some of your coaching programs? How can people reach out to you? They can uh, email me at uh, Antoine, that's spelled A-N-T-I-O-N-E, at directingfootsteps.com. Again, that's Antoine at directingfootsteps.com. You can always feel free to go directly to my website. Uh, it's AntoineAnderson.com. Uh, that has all my uh, materials, my books that are there, the coaching programs, the virtual or the digital, excuse me, coaching programs that are available. In fact, anybody who uses the um, discount code ODAT, I'll give them a 10% discount oh, on my the book of Bargain Basement Jesus, uh, The Cost of Following, the hard copy 10% or 10% off of the e-book as well. And so awesome. they just have to use the, the uh, ODAT as their discount code. Oh, we love a discount. There you go. For 10 our Bargain off. Basement Jesus. <laughs> Sell it. Awesome. Well, listen, thank you so much, Antoine. I really appreciate your time. And I just uh, applaud the work that you're doing. I'm so grateful we've had a, a chance to kind of go through it and your testimony and i look forward to watching your career and seeing you do great things i listen i appreciate you and i'm looking forward to that book i'm looking forward to you finish you as soon as it's done i'll send yes. it to you i'll send it to you you can uh yo you can be one of what do they call that when someone recommends your book or, or the, uh, yeah the recommendations yeah. you make recommendations yeah awesome okay awesome. I, I, I sign me up <laughs> all right thank you so much Anson. you have a great day you do the same thank you all right bye-bye bye-bye one last thing before you go, if you enjoyed the podcast today, please don't forget to subscribe on iTunes or Stitcher and leave a review. And if you'd like to make a donation to the podcast and help me keep the lights on, you can do so by visiting odatchat.com. There's a donation button or membership button on the right hand side. Have a great day. Thank you so much for joining us.